Father, we praise you that preaching is not in vain. And we remember that it is not so because Christ is risen. And it is our prayer, Lord, that as we open up your holy, sacred text, that we would see it as a living book, that the Spirit would so minister, Lord, that our affections are stirred, our consciences are pricked, our wills are moved, not because the man with the mic has any sort of charisma, but because we wait expectantly upon you, And because, Lord, you have said that you will do a work in your people by your word. And so, Lord, help us, we pray. Help our hearts to burn within us as we walk along the way this morning. We pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Agatha Christie is best known as the Queen of Crime. She was made a dame by Queen Elizabeth II in 1971 because of her incredible contributions to literature. Her 66 crime novels have sold more copies than J.K. Rowling's books put together. She's actually on par with William Shakespeare for sales. She writes crime. She writes murder mysteries. Some of you might know some of the titles that are famous, Murder on the Orient Express, Murder on the Nile, and then there were none, the man in the brown suit. One of her most beloved characters is named Hekiel Poirot. He's a Belgian detective, not French, Belgian. And I've read through a couple of Hekiel Poirot mysteries before, and I just find them absolutely riveting. No kidding, she is the queen of crime. And usually as you read the novel, you can expect a similar layout, just about a similar layout in every single novel that she writes. Usually, you know, the first couple of chapters are an introduction to all of the characters that you're going to meet over the course of the novel. You start to learn about some rifts that exist between some of the characters. Then the crime happens. And then right after the crime, Hakil Poirot sort of steps in and he starts to interview all of the suspects. And over the course, the bulk of the book, there's just interview after interview, investigation after investigation, until it all culminates In a single room, Hakil Poirot grabs everyone that's purportedly involved in the crime. He gathers them into a living room or, or an office somewhere, and he begins to explain all that he has discovered from his investigation until finally, in the last few paragraphs of that chapter, the answer to the crime is given, the solution is given. And usually as you're reading through this chapter, I mean, there's nothing, there's, there's like no sort of action in this chapter, but your adrenaline is pumping the entire time. You're going, how is he going to unveil and unmask what has taken place? It, it's just this convoluted sequence of facts all throughout the book, and you're trying to pair it together. And finally, the genius Hakil Poirot sits you down in the living room, as it were, and he says, all right, here's how it all worked out. And you have that aha moment. Of course. All of the facts were there right from the beginning. I, I, I heard Sally say this in chapter 7. I, heard, I saw Michael through the text put the dagger here or there. It, just, it all begins to make sense. Everything starts to make sense. There's this excitement. There's this adrenaline. There's this thrill as everything begins to make sense at the end of Agatha Christie's novels. As we come to Luke 24 this morning, we witness a similar phenomenon in the passage before us. The text takes us from confusion to clarity. Jesus' followers are confused by his life, his death, and now the empty tomb that they witness. And what we find is this, as we scan these verses in Luke 24, verses 13 to 35, we see that when we encounter the risen Christ... When we encounter him, everything begins to make sense. Jesus Christ, the suffering and risen Savior, is the key that unlocks the door, bringing us from confusion to clarity. He brings us from ignorance to being awestruck at his majesty. And friends, it's my prayer this morning that as we venture through this text, we would be awestruck as we encounter the resurrected Christ, 
through his word this morning. I pray that some, as they encounter him through the word this morning, would bow the knee and know him as the risen Savior, the hope of the nations. And I pray that for some of us here this morning, uh, many of us here this morning who know the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that he would stir up zeal within our hearts. Don't we need zeal this morning? Oftentimes, we treat the gospel a little bit like a Christmas present. You know, someone's wrapped the Christmas present, it's gone under the tree, you're like, oh, I think I know what that is, I'm so excited to open it. Christmas Day comes, you open it, yeah, that's it, that's what I wanted. You put it up on the shelf, I mean, if it's me, you put it up on the shelf. <laughs> you probably get more interesting things. Um, but you take that gift, you know, you put it up on the shelf, you put it on the table, you put it in your room. The next morning you wake up and you are just, you're so excited. I, I got that thing. I got that watch. I got that hair clip. Whatever it is. A week later, I, you're still excited about it. A month later, yeah, you know, your, your excitement has sort of faded a little bit. Three months later, four months later, six months later, ah, we've sort of forgotten about it. Our zeal for that particular object and item waned as time went on. Friends, the gospel is not like that. We have been given this revelation that we might come back to it again and again and again and know the risen Savior, the fullness of His love, the glory of His resurrection, the power with which the Father raised the Son from the grave. And so I pray this morning, friends, if you are a Christian, that your zeal would be ignited, that the Lord would use that oxygen of his spirit to fan into flame that zeal that we are so often lacking in. When we encounter the risen Christ, everything begins to make sense. So please, grab your copy of the scripture and let's read verse 13 to 35, Luke chapter 24. That very day, this is the first day of the week, Jesus is risen. That very day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing to je together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of our women, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road 
and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. We're going to go on a journey with these two disciples on the road to Emmaus from confusion to clarity. They go through this journey in three steps. Over the course of this text, these disciples who have encountered Jesus move from being ignorant to being informed to being awestruck. Those are our three steps. From being ignorant to being informed to being awestruck. Look at point number one, verse 13 to 24. An encounter with the risen Christ exposes our ignorance. I distinctly remember where I was when 9-11 happened. It is vivid in my memory. My family had just moved to Nanaimo. My dad was taking the co-manager position at a Walmart in Nanaimo, and we had been in a Best Western hotel while we looked for a rental for about a month. We were eating breakfast downstairs in the lobby of that hotel. There was a lake behind the hotel. I can picture it. It's vivid. That morning on September 11th, we woke up and we got dressed. We got ready for school, which we had just started attending in Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. And my dad, I remember the tone of his voice, called my mom into their adjoining room. Julie, come in here. And my mom walked in and I walked with her just in time to see the plane hit the tower. Stuff like this, events like these, both positive and negative, monumental events, make a mark on us. I bet you if we surveyed the room this morning and I said, where were you when 9-11 happened? Answers like this would just fly out of your mouth. I asked my two brothers, Sean and Sergey, this morning, where were you when 9-11 happened? They didn't even have to think about it. It just came right out of their mouth. They didn't even ask me why I asked them. These things, these sort of events, make a mark on us. And then they are the talk of the town for weeks and months and years. And even though life goes on and we stop talking about them, they have left an impression, both positive and negative events. When they are monumental, they leave a mark on us. We have to understand as we begin this journey with these Emmaus disciples this morning, that they are wrapped up in one of these moments. The Twin Towers is about this small compared to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the point to which all history for decades and centuries was moving had just happened that weekend. These men are mixed up in a moment that will mark them for all time, the greatest news of all time. And in the early verses of the text, we see that these men are grappling with who is this Jesus of Nazareth? We had had hopes for him, but these hopes seem to be dashed. What's with his life? What's with his death? What's with this empty tomb? And this is where the risen Christ, that these men are discussing these monumental events. This is where the risen Christ joins these two disciples on the road. The text tells us that the men are divinely kept from recognizing him. And Jesus asks this question, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? This is where the process begins. As the Lord looks to move these men from confusion to clarity. Now, the response of the disciples is twofold, as it is with most things. When, when we ask someone a question, usually there's a twofold response. There's the verbal response and there's the nonverbal response. You see the nonverbal response first. These men, as Jesus asks this question, they freeze. They stand still, the text says. They're shocked that he doesn't know. They're they're, they're standing there in their sorrow. The second half of the description of the nonverbal communication is that they were sorrowful. They're disoriented. Our hopes have been dashed, we find out later in the text. We thought that this was going to be the one who would redeem Israel. There's the nonverbal response. They stand still. And they are sorrowful. But then there's the verbal communication. And this helps to unpack the men's emotional state. One of the disciples, Cleopas, exposes his ignorance by asking a question in reply. A fantastic question. Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? Essentially, do you live under a rock? What irony. He is looking at the subject of all of these events and saying, you don't know what's happened? 
I mean, the irony is just, it, it, it's, it's way too funny. And as we look, and as, as this ignorance of these disciples is exposed, here's what I want us to see, friends. I want us to see grace at work in this text. It is gracious that God would work with ignorant people. <laughs> it is gracious that He would work with ignorant people, that He would expose our ignorance so that we would leave it behind and know Him truly. So Jesus prompts the disciples further with a, you know, another question. He says, what things do you speak about? He knows. He's trying to get out of them. What do you believe about the events of this past weekend? And we find in their verbal explanation a lot of raw facts. They're accurate raw facts. And behind these raw facts are misunderstandings of who Jesus of Nazareth truly is. The disciples have failed to connect the dots. They speak about his ministry. He was a prophet, mighty in word and deed. They speak about his death, that he was condemned and crucified by the religious leaders. Check, check, yep, no, everything lines up so far. They speak of their hope that he would be the one to redeem Israel. <laughs> and he would redeem Israel. They speak about the empty tomb, that Jesus' body is nowhere to be found. Check, 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 all these raw facts. Accurate. But two things are abundantly evident as these raw facts are shared. First, these disciples have no category for a suffering Savior. They are disoriented because they did not expect that the Messiah, predicted of old in the Old Testament, would come as a suffering servant. And secondly, the disciples are expecting in some fashion a political, perhaps a military conqueror who would redeem Israel. Both of these expectations are left unmet. These disciples have a caricature of Jesus. A caricature is a photo of someone that has exaggerated features on it. So if you Google caricature, you say, what is a caricature? You'll see probably right away a picture of Will Smith, and his ears are like the size of an elephant, and you know his, his head is massive, but we can all tell that it's Will Smith. There's another one of Barack Obama. Again, his nose is huge, his eyes are big, but we can tell that it's Barack Obama. It's not the real Barack Obama, though. It's a caricature. It's a fake. These men had a caricature of Jesus. They did not believe in the real Jesus. Friends, I wonder how often we carry, as Christians, a little bit of a caricature of Jesus in our hearts and minds. And I wonder if you're not a Christian here this morning, how big your caricature of Jesus, how obscured, how exaggerated your caricature of Jesus is. Friends, for all of us, who, who, who do you say that Jesus is? If you had to speak about Jesus to someone else in the congregation for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, what would you say about him? What is the portrait of Jesus that would emerge? Would it be an accurate one? And I ask these questions to everyone here, whether you call yourself a Christian or not. What is your view of Jesus? God graciously wants to expose our ignorance of his Messiah so that we can know his Messiah truly. Here's six sort of profiles, six sort of caricatures that maybe sometimes factor into our thinking as Christians and non-Christians. Friend, let me ask you this. Is the Jesus in your head a feel-good, optimistic, inspirational Jesus? I go to him to get pumped up so I can feel good about myself and my life. He is the king of affirmations. He's my life coach. This sort of person who has this idea, this caricature of Jesus, tends to only go to Jesus when they need an emotional boost. Friend, is the Jesus in your head a shallow Jesus? He's not all that mighty, not all that strong, not all that sufficient to save. Do you know how you know if you're in this category? You don't go to him. You don't submit to him. You don't trust in him. Sure, I, I pray at meals and I go to church and, you know, but he doesn't run my life. I just do those things because I want to check that religious box. If we saw Jesus as truly worthy of worship and might, he would, we would go with him along the way. Sometimes we act as though Jesus is functionally shallow. So do you worship the shallow Jesus? Or is, Jesus, is the Jesus in your head a superhero Jesus? He swoops in to rescue you in moments where you lose the handle on life. 
You only reach out to Jesus when you are in a bind. He is only useful when things are going sour. The elevator is descending 30 floors, free falling, and up, you know, up comes Superman, and boom, now that's when I go to Jesus because I'm in a bind. Is the Jesus in your head merely a wise sage? Jesus is just a wise guy. He's got lots of helpful things to say. He's that grandpa that sits on me with the couch and helps direct my life in the way that it should go. He's, but he's just a wise sage. Is the Jesus in your head a wrathful judge solely? He's mean and he's harsh. His ministry is one of condemnation. He's a legalist. He's a looking for an excuse to send you to hell. Is the Jesus in your head a skittish lamb? He would never say anything offensive. He would never call me out on my sin. His commands, they're more like guidelines. The hard sayings of Jesus, mm -mm, those don't exist. Do we believe in a caricature of Jesus? Or do we believe in the real Jesus? The one who is Savior. The one who is Redeemer. The one who is the propitiation for our sins. He stands in our place on Calvary's cross as our substitute, bearing the load of our sins. Is he the one who is truly God and truly man? Do you believe in the full deity and the full humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Jesus walked and talked? That he was a real guy on this planet earth? Is he the forgiver? Is he the gracious one? Is he the compassionate one? Is he the ever-present help in times of trouble? Friends, do you believe in the Jesus of the Bible? Or to some pop culture, some preconceived notion, some biased caricature factor into your thinking about Jesus? Oh, God graciously wants to expose our ignorance on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that we might know him truly and hang on to him and worship him in the fullness of his deity, in the fullness of his person. And so anytime we encounter the scriptures at large, and the gospels in particular, we should pray that God would help us to root out our misconceptions of Jesus and make clear to us the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ so that we know him truly. An encounter with the risen Christ exposes our ignorance text goes on from there, though. Jesus doesn't leave these disciples in their ignorance, and he doesn't do that with us as well. He reveals himself to them through his word. And so notice the second point in verse 25, 26, and 27. We find that an encounter with the risen Christ not only exposes our ignorance, but it also explains the scriptures. The scriptures are made sense of when we encounter the risen Christ. Jesus is the interpretive key of Scripture. You want to understand the Scriptures? You need to look to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought about this next statement for a while this week, and I was sharing it with my wife. I vet these things through my wife before I say them. And I said, Bree, I, I, I'm certain I'm not exaggerating when I say that one of the greatest moments of my life is when I realized that the Bible is one unified progressive revelation. I, like, oh man, what a mercy when God showed that to me, that the Bible is one unified progressive revelation. Bree and I see one of the, this as one of the greatest graces in our lives. I remember the people and the resources that helped us see that. Tim Keller, Dave Barker, Tom Schreiner, Ligon Duncan. I remember where I was sitting. I remember the, the, the videos I was watching when he revealed that our Bible hangs together. It is one story. It is not a disjointed bunch of books 
bound together by a publisher. No, it is bound together by the spirit of the living God, and it tells one story about how he is redeeming creation, redeeming his people progressively all throughout history, and it culminates in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I remember every time that I encountered that truth early on, and I just thought grace of all graces, that God would reveal this to his people, that God would show this to his people, that God would help me to see that when I read Leviticus, I don't have to be lost and sort of like look around and go, where are all these laws? Man, these people at Sinai, they must be bored to death. No, God is unfolding his plan. And I need to find out when I am in the scriptures at what point of his plan he, 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 we're in so that I can see where Christ is and I can orient myself and understand what the scriptures are actually saying. Friends, you see this? Leviticus and Titus, they're not separate books. They're not just like unrelated books. You know, Titus, well, I understand that one. He talks to me about elders and deacons and you know what? I should live a certain way in the world now that I'm a Christian so they see my good deeds and, you know, the world comes to God. Okay, I can understand that. But Leviticus, all these laws that we don't keep anymore, and all of these, you know, regulations and priestly garbs and the Day of Atonement. Okay, I guess we can redeem the Day of Atonement a little bit, right? That has something to do with Jesus, doesn't it? <laughs> when we understand that the Bible is one unified progressive revelation Oh, it unlocks all the scriptures to us. It unlocks every verse. It unlocks every chapter. It helps us to see Jesus in all of his fullness. He doesn't just appear in the Gospels. He is found everywhere. He is anticipated in the old. He is realized in the new. Promises are made in the old. Promises are wonderfully kept in the new. And friends, the New Testament authors want us to see this again and again and again. Why? Because they quote the scriptures ad nauseum. The gospels, I mean, just think about the gospel of Luke. We're in the gospel of Luke this morning. As Jesus arrives on the scene in his incarnation, what do we get in the first two chapters? Well, you know, the story of the wise men and Mary and Elizabeth and, you know, Zechariah. And <laughs> we get the Old Testament quoted again and again and again. Remember all those promises Luke is saying? Fulfilled. Jesus is here. Here's the herald. He has arrived. Paul, 13 out of 29 letters in the New Testament he is responsible for. Over 200 allusions to the Old Testament. Over 200 allusions. Then you get to that capstone of the canon book, the book of Revelation. It is, it is the piece that when you, when you stick it in, the whole arch is able to hold together. When you get to the book of Revelation, guess what? You get 404 verses. And 278 of them, that's 78% of those verses, have an Old Testament allusion. 500 Old Testament allusions in the book of Revelation. Out of 400 verses, the New Testament authors are pointing us back to the Old Testament, and they are saying to us, guys, you are not going to understand what is going on unless you understand how God has worked all throughout history to show us our need for a Savior, to point us in the direction of Jesus Christ so that when Matthew chapter 1 happens, we go, finally, he's here. He's arrived. Good Friday can take place in 30 years. You know, Easter Sunday, he's going to rise again. Praise the Lord. The Bible has always been telling us about this. The Bible is one unified, progressive revelation. This is what Jesus tells these guys about on the road to Emmaus. He says, you guys, you don't understand Jesus of Nazareth. Why? Because you don't understand your Old Testaments. He rebukes them. He says, it's a hard issue. You've misinterpreted the scriptures. You've, you fail to see things that are in the scriptures. And he graciously gives them a master class in biblical theology. He shows them how the Old Testament anticipates the suffering of the Messiah. There must be a cross before there is a crown. He shows them through all the scriptures, through Moses and the prophets, and later in verse 44, we see the Psalms. He shows them how Jesus had always been anticipated and how his suffering had been something that they should have been able to see in their Old Testaments. What would it, what would it have been like to have been on the road with these disciples as Jesus talked to them 
about how the old and the new fit together. It would have been incredible to hear this lecture, to hear Christ's emphasis, to, 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 to be able to observe what passages of Scripture did Jesus use? Which themes did He highlight as He spoke to these guys about who He was from the Old Testament? Sometimes I wish I could have been there. But you know, as I've processed this text this week, I've realized we don't have to have been there to know what He said. We have the whole counsel of God at our disposal. We have the apostolic witness to these events in our Bible, because Luke doesn't just write one volume, he writes two. And you better believe that the apostles took some of the content of this lecture and used it in their preaching. The apostles would have used this in their preaching, no doubt. Scripture has always spoken about a substitute that must suffer before there is glory. Think about Genesis chapter 22. God tells Abraham, Abraham, sacrifice your son, your only son. Demonstrate your faith. Abraham goes to Mount Moriah. The knife is poised to strike. And an angel says to Abraham, Abraham, uh uh, you don't need to do this. A substitute's been provided. A substitute in what? A ram. Hebrews 11 looks back on this event and says, This is a resurrection narrative. Why? Because Isaac was as good as dead. But God raised him from the dead, as it were, by saving his life as the knife is poised to strike and a substitute is provided, a lamb. Think about the entire sacrificial system in the Pentateuch. Lambs, bulls, doves, pigeons, blood after blood after blood is spilled. Why? So that the people of Israel can live in community with God, Yahweh. So they could be in fellowship with him. Why? Because he's a holy God and we are not. We are stained with sin. And so if you will approach him, you need the blood of an animal. There's suffering before glory. Think about Psalm 22, where David, the psalmist, cries out to God in his distress. What words does Jesus use on the cross as he is suffering and dying? My God, my God. Psalm 22, why have you forsaken me? But if we read Psalm 22, how does Psalm 22 end? It goes from suffering, distress, what? To glory. There is trust in Yahweh. He will deal rightly with me. And then we think about that monumental text that Jesus must have used as he walked with these disciples along the way. Isaiah 52 and 53 We're supposed to think about this suffering servant, the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. The one who would come to bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. The one who was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. The one on whom the chastisement that we deserved fell, by whose wounds we are healed. It was necessary, Jesus emphasizes, that the Christ suffer these things before entering into his glory. That is what the Scriptures have always pointed us to. Friends, all of Scripture is pointing us in the direction of Jesus, the risen and exalted King. Jesus shows the Emmaus disciples how they should understand their Bibles, and through this text, He is showing us how do we understand, how should we understand our Bibles. Jesus is the culmination of revelation. He is the Word made flesh. He is the king of the canon. He is Lord of every line. He is the sinner's suffering servant. He is the spotless lamb slain. He is the Christ, the Son of God. Salvation is in his name. Scripture testifies to Christ everywhere. And the world looks at us and they say, as you hold that Bible there, you hold a book full of convoluted facts and contradictions. But a true reading... A true understanding of the scriptures shows us that that label is absolutely inappropriate. The Bible is one unified, progressive revelation. And if you don't have the interpretive key handy, Jesus Christ, you won't understand it. Friends, let me invite you this Easter to understand Christ in his fullness as we read our Bibles in light of a resurrected 
Savior. An encounter with the risen Christ explains the scriptures. One final movement as we go from confusion to clarity. An encounter with the resurrected Christ, it, it, it exposes our ignorance, it explains the scriptures, and finally we find in verse 28 to 35, it affects our hearts. As Jesus' lecture ends, the group is approaching the village of Emmaus, and Jesus acts as if he's going further, but the disciples urge him to stay, the, you know, the best hours of the day for walking are behind us, so why don't you just stay with us? And it's at that moment that the revelation of who Jesus is comes. Jesus says, yeah, fine, I'll, I'll stay. And they sit down at table together, and the text tells us that it's as Jesus breaks the bread that their disciples' eyes are opened. This is really significant because in Luke, two other events surrounding bread have taken place. You'll remember the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus multiplies the, the, the fish and the loaves. And as Jesus breaks bread there, what is he doing? He's, he's not just performing a miracle for miracle's sake, like, hey, look, this is fancy, see what I can do? That's not the point at all. Jesus is revealing something about who he is. He is Moses. He is the, the, the new Moses. He, bread, he is the bread that has come down from heaven. He, he is the Lord. He is the maker. He is the creator of all things. Surely he can make a few loaves and some fish multiply. He's the Christ. So in Luke chapter 9, we get this significant indication of, you know, who Jesus is. We get, we, we get a look at his identity through the breaking of bread. But then we get also to Luke chapter 22, what happens in Luke 22. Jesus is sitting around a table with his disciples, and he gets them to take a cup, and he gets them to take bread, and Jesus breaks the bread, and what does he say? This is the Last Supper. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus is revealing something about who he is. And now, as he breaks bread, what is he doing? He is revealing something about who he is. The blindness of the disciples is lifted. God had blinded their eyes to the identity of Jesus Christ. And their blindness is lifted. And they understand this is the Christ. See, the puzzle starts to come together. The mystery is being solved. All the dots are being connected as the Lord lifts the, the blindness off the eyes of these disciples. And two responses ensue. Do you see it in the text? Two responses ensue. One, we find out about the burning hearts of these disciples. And second, we find out that there are confessing lips. There are burning hearts and there are confessing lips. Friend, have you ever sat through a sermon before? <laughs> where the Lord was clearly working on your heart. Where you were aware in that moment, and then subsequent to that moment, the Lord was dealing with me. The Lord was using His Word to help me understand my sin, His beauty, the resurrected Savior, whatever it was. He was dealing with me in that moment. And you look back on that moment with fondness because you see how God was using His Word like a surgeon to do a precise work on your heart. That's what it's like to have your heart burning within you. The disciples admit that their hearts burned within them as Jesus had explained the scriptures to them. Of course, they're thinking. That explains it. Everything is making sense now. Brothers and sisters, I pray this verse often before sermons that Sean preaches, sermons that I preach. I pray that the Lord would do this supernatural work among us every single Sunday because it's a divine work. It's not a manufactured work. Lord, would you so teach us about the risen Christ that as we hear your word, we have an encounter with you and our hearts burn within us and we are led into greater heights of faith and love and obedience and worship. Their hearts burned within them. But notice, secondly, the confessing lips. The text tells us that the disciples get up that very hour to return to Jerusalem. Hey, remember what they said before? Hey, you know, the best hours for walking are sort of behind us, so like maybe you should stay with us, Jesus. They don't even think about that now that they know who Jesus is. 
They hightail it back to Jerusalem. They have to speak about the risen Christ. And they get back, and they're not even able to get anything out right away. You see in the text right at the end there, in verse 34, the 11 are gathered together, and the 11 talk about something that's taken place in their midst before these two disciples can even get anything out. They say, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Notice what they call Jesus. Significant. They call him Lord. Why? Because they understand who he is. They understand that he is the Messiah, the sent one of God. They understand that this is the identity of Jesus. And then the Emmaus disciples are actually able to get out what they have witnessed. There are confessing lips. These men are confessing who Jesus Christ is. When we encounter the risen Christ, our hearts burn within us, and our lips cannot help but confess the lordship of Christ. Friend, this morning... As we have encountered the risen Christ through the word, let me ask you this question. If you do not know Jesus, why would you not bow to his lordship? He is the only true savior. If you don't know him, bow to him. Confess your sins. Trust in him by faith. You don't need to work for your salvation. He has done it all on Calvary's cross and he has risen again victorious from the grave. Trust in him. And friend, if you do know him, Go and tell others about him, this resurrected, glorified Savior. My wife and I were at the park, as we often are with our rambunctious little boy. Uh, He was climbing up the playground, jumping down the slide, you know, all these sorts of things. And a older lady and her niece walked up to the park. And as typically happens, the kids started playing together, and so we sort of ventured over to this lady and started talking to her. And she was asking us about our family, telling us about her family. And at one point, Bree asked a very, a very good question. Do you have any kids? And the lady almost had this Emmaus Road experience where she stood still and looked sorrowful. And she said, Yeah, I had one. I lost her. 34 years old. Cancer. And there were tears in her eyes. And she kept talking. She said, it really messed me up. I couldn't leave my house for two years. Of course she couldn't leave her house for two years. So I thought about it more and more. Of course this lady couldn't leave her house for two years. She doesn't know the hope of Jesus Christ. She doesn't know about the resurrection. Of course Daniel drinks himself silly every night after the death of his spouse. He doesn't know the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Of course Michael medicates himself so that he's numb because he lost his son at a young age. Because he doesn't know about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it got me thinking how many people are out there that we have constant contact with who do not know the hope that we declare this morning. We are a happy people. I said to so many people as we walked in this morning, happy Easter. We are a joyful people. We are a thankful people. Why? Because Christ is risen. And the text tells us, go and tell somebody else. Make sure that the Annas and the Daniels and the Michaels of the world know so that when suffering and hardship and loss hit these people, they have the hope of the resurrected Christ. And friend, if you are sitting here this morning, I just want to press in on you this morning. If you are sitting here this morning and you have heard about Jesus again and again and again, and your life, your life looks nothing like what the New Testament says a Christian's life should look like. Because you just sort of push them off. And you, you don't really want to commit. Friend, I'm speaking to you. Under the power of God, by the Holy Spirit, I am speaking to you this morning. Trust in the risen Savior. It is the greatest news in the world. It will save you from your sins. He will forgive you. He will give you hope. You have a future in Him. Know him this morning. There are, there are people as pastors that we think about all the time who gather with us Sunday in and Sunday out, who we are uncertain of where they sit. 
And friend, I, friends, I see some of you this morning, and I want you to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has risen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for revealing your son to us. We praise you for all that your word speaks so faithfully. And we pray, O oh God, that you would do a wondrous work in the hearts of those who are sitting here with us this morning. Pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. Help us to see the glory of the risen Jesus. And help us as we continue in worship. We pray it for Jesus' sake. Amen.